pray for. We want to pray for Trish. Pete, it's great to see you here today. And we want to pray for Jill as well. Please have a look in your new sheet about that. A couple of weeks, about a month ago now, we told you about a new role, uh, uh, an interim role that we put out there, a youth support worker that would help me just as I oversee the youth while we have an ongoing vacancy for our youth worker, if you can follow that. And I'm really pleased to tell you that Sammy Lees, no relation, no, no, actually there is, you know, uh, um, has been pointed out. I took a huge step back as soon as he told me he was interested and, and Craig and Sally interviewed him and he'll be starting along with Barry as our children's worker this week. So do pray for them both. Yeah. Heather, do you want to come up and talk to us about Alpha? Good. Please stand. Acts 20 verse 24. But I do not count my life if any value to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the good news of God's grace. Are we using every opportunity to spread the good news of Jesus? <laughs> um, I've got some cards. Stan's got some cards. I want you to write three names on these cards, please, that you are going to pray for and then invite to Alpha over the next four weeks before we start on the 28th. Yes. And I'd like to do a prayer together, please. If you're content to read that with me. God, I want my life to testify to your goodness and grace. Refocus my heart on you. Help me pursue you first, above all else. Nothing in life matters more than bringing glory to you. Show me who I need to share you with and give me boldness. In Jesus' name, amen. Any questions, ask us. How do we get hold of the cards? There's some on the desk. Okay. We'll hand them out at the back at the end. Yeah, yeah, brilliant, brilliant. So we've got Alpha starting on the 28th, yeah? And the warmest ground for evangelism is out there. The people that you are speaking to every day, and we challenged you a month ago to start engaging with your non-Christian friends and getting them ready to a point where you could invite them along to Alpha. And yes, it might mean that you need to come for the first week. Would that be so bad? So I really want to encourage you. And prayer opens, doors, opens doorways into people's hearts. So I want you to encourage you to take, um, to take a card and put some names on. Children, you're going back to school, aren't you, soon? Are you excited? No. Well, <laughs> parents are absolutely ecstatic. And Sally's going to come up and we're going to pray for you because you're going to have an incredible time. Sally. Good morning, everyone. So, yep, today is officially Moving Up Sunday. And I know some of these children and young people have waited a long time to go to their new groups. So we do want to pray for everyone, but we appreciate coming to the front is quite hard. And also, from a safeguarding point of view, we don't always film the children without permission. So I'm going to get the children into their groups around the room. So leaders, I need you to listen for your group. Sammy's going to come and help me hand out the posters. So first of all, we've got our joiners who are naught to three. So that's any of our little ones. If you want to go and stand with Jean, wherever Jean is, Jean's going to go and stand over there. And if you and your little one are in joiners, I'd love you to go and stand with them. And I want somebody to tell me at the end why we chose these names. So the first one is Jay, joiners. The next one is E, Explorers. And we also have Seekers, which is S as well, because actually these groups are in the children's room. So these are Foundation, which is Nursery, up to Year 2, okay? So basically your Foundation Junior Age. So if you can go and stand towards the side there, I've got two volunteers for Seekers as well. This is always a bit crazy when it involves moving people. Okay, so I've put things up. Children, if you are in the children's room, will you go and stand with your leaders over there, please? And any leaders that are in Explorers or Seekers, go and stand with them. Okay, so children, you can get it. Next one is United. So United, we would like you to go and stand over in that back corner with Malcolm and Claire. 
So in fact, you can just stand at the back. That's, you can see your banner. So United is our junior age children. So they are year three to year six. So if you are going into year three next week, and I know we've got some new children, so we just especially want to welcome Amelia Mills is joining us next week. Ellie, Ellie Moore should be over there now. We should have Bethany over there as well, and we should have Rebecca as well. Awesome. So we've got a J E S U. Hold on. <laughs> I'm seeing something here. There's a clue. The last one is surround, which is our youth group. So youth, if you can go and stand over where Charlotte is. Okay, so youth is for year seven to year 13. And going up into year seven, so into youth, we've got Sam Khan. Some of these aren't here today. We've got Abby as well. We've got Amelia. We've got Priya and Ria. I've seen them this morning. And we've got Leo. And we've also got another Samuel, but I'm not sure he's here either. So well done. So church, just have a look round. We are so blessed that this is only half of our young people. A lot of them, I think, are on holiday. So I'm going to hand over to Ben, but we would just really like to pray for these groups and also for the children going back to school next week. Wonderful, isn't it? Church, you don't want to just listen to my prayer. Yeah, let's turn around. Let's reach our hands out. Let's just pray for these young lives as they start a new chapter and a new season. Father God, September is always a new turning point as we go back to school. Lord, and I pray that all of our children and our young people would know that they never go back alone, that they carry you with them. Lord, and any worry and anxiety, Lord, I just want you to take it from them right now because it has no right to rob any energy that they have over these next few days. Lord, and I know that as each of them reconnect with friends that they may not have seen for six weeks as they see teachers and they remember their school is the same as it always was, Lord, all of that anxiety will just dissipate. Lord, we pray for a great encouragement that they would really enjoy this first week back. Lord, and that they would know that you have placed them in the right school for the right time right now. Lord Jesus, I pray for teachers, I pray for our leaders here, Lord, that you would give them wisdom, how to nurture and grow, and how to teach and disciple the young people under their care. Holy Spirit, would you move supernaturally this year? Lord, we think of all our children and young people who are moving into new groups, different rooms, different helpers and leaders, Lord Jesus. Let them know that this is their new place of safety and security. And when they come to church, they are with family. They are with you. Lord Jesus, and they will be mighty blessed this year. Holy Spirit, move in your power amongst our children and young people. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Bless you, everyone. Let's give them a round of applause, please. You can come and sit back down. Well done, everybody. Band, if you'd like to come and join me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes, there are a number who are having a quick getaway weekend, we can tell. Come and sit down and take your seats. Right, let's stand, everybody. Let's, we've already started to worship. We've started to worship in all the things we've shared and all the things we've done. But let's just now just really focus ourselves. Let's stand together. Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus. Lord, we don't just sing songs this morning. We sing songs to you. We sing songs about you. For you are worthy. Holy Spirit, move through our song now, we pray. In Jesus' name.
wanted to encourage you children that you know we've just sung he won't fail he won't let us go he, he's going to be with us and I want to remind you that as you go back into your schools you don't go on your own you have angels that are going to go with you into your room into your new classroom you're going to have the Holy Spirit who dwells within you he is going with you as well Jesus is in the room with you as well and the Father is with you I tell you there is a huge bunch of people going with you into your room and I just want to remind you and also to remind you that we pray for you I don't have any children of my own but I still pray for the children in this church so even if you have grown-ups who don't know Jesus and you might think but there's nobody praying for me let me tell you you have a whole family here that are praying for you regularly. And your Sunday school teachers, your youth group leaders, they pray for you every day. So, 
as you go back into school, into your new classrooms, I want you to hold your head up high and I want you to remember that you are children of the King. Not King Charles III, but the King of all kings. So you walk tall, you stand up straight, and you remember who you are. All right? And we look forward to hearing your stories of how Jesus is going to watch over you and keep you. May you all have really good friendships and that you make new friends in your new classrooms. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Thank you, Sally. And with that, children, young people, it's time for you to go to your groups. Some of you are in a new group. Have a wonderful time. Be blessed as you go. We're going to stay in a time of worship here once um, everyone has gone. I know there's a few um, parents who are a bit nervous about their children starting school as well. But as Sally has encouraged us, God is with us. God is with these children as they go, wherever they go. So, Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you that as we've sung, you're faithful through generations. God, we thank you that we can see that in our own lives and in the, in the lives of our children here. Lord, we praise you for that. You're faithful through generations. Hallelujah. God, we just praise your name. Let's just take a moment, church, just to refocus ourselves amidst all the noise and the busyness. God, we love you. We're here for you, Jesus, today. We're here for you, Jesus. God, we thank you that you're faithful through generations. God, we thank you that we can put our hope and our trust in you. Jesus, we thank you that you came for us. God, that you so loved, you so loved us. You sent your son to die for us, that we might be reconciled to you, that we might have relationship with you. God, we praise you for that. We praise you, Lord, that we can receive that newness of life through you today. God, we stand, Lord, a thankful people today. We give you praise, Lord. We give you praise. And I just bless your holy name that it's so true that we can say with conviction you, Lord Jesus, won't fail. You will be with us. And right now, I want to pray specifically for Fran's carers. They know of you, Lord Jesus, and I pray that you will comfort the lady that looks after him and his husband and her husband. <laughs> I pray for your rich blessing on them and that because they have heard about Jesus through Fran, they will really know and seek you. So like we were saying, I'm going to put, I know the names of those people, but I'll put that on the list for people who will need to follow or learn about Jesus in the Alpha group. And also, I just was really... Um, concerned for Christians who are still living in the Ukraine. And Lord, I want to say to you, thank you. We've sung those words about you. If they continue, may you help them continue to put their faith in you, Lord Jesus the Rock. And may they see you do wonderful miracles of protection and care for them. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. In the darkness we were waiting Without hope, without light Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes Fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word.
from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt. Praise the Father, praise the Son. church of God arise the church of God arise father we stand heads tall father we are your church and we choose to rise at this time not a hide 
Father God, we know the church has had a checkered past, but we're not going to apologize for that anymore, Lord, because we're going to move forward. Lord, you call us at this time, Lord, to be your church. Mighty God. Mighty God. Three in one. Majesty. You're the church when you go out of these doors. You're the church when you leave for work at t- tomorrow. Stop picturing a building. Never was. It's purely practical. Purely practical. If we were in a different country, warmer, we wouldn't need one. Lord, I want to break the chain that we create in our minds that we're in church and not the church we're on mission you know our battle is not against flesh and blood I need to say that because we we need to move out of a peacetime mentality we don't fight against people but we do fight against powers and principalities. And we need to move. Over the summer, God spoke to me really clearly, Ben, you need to move from a peacetime mentality to a battle mentality. To a battle mentality. The church of God arise. That's you. Ben, Claire, Heather, David, Crystal, Amen, Jane, Mark, Alex, you are the church. Let's be light to a world that needs to know him. In Jesus' name, Amen. Yeah. I can't do anything with what you do with that. That was a nice time of worship. That was a nice thing that Ben said, yes. Yes, we decide tomorrow morning when you go out to work what mentality you go out in. And I tell you, I, I, I work even when I'm not being paid. <laughs> yeah? So all you retirees, <laughs> you know, amen. You may be seated. Bless you. Thank you, band. R- really appreciate it. Um, just before I invite Mark up, I want to just do it now because um, I always forget something. It's our picnic Sunday. So as you know, church, for many, many years, first Sunday of the month, we picnic together. We very rarely get outside, um, but we have done, but I don't think it will be today. Why? Because we think it's really great to have food together. Something happens, yeah, and there's the teddy bears picnic for all those in join us and explorers please do stop back and we fellowship together and if you've never stopped back you know probably after we've had our teas and coffees because it's it's father god holy spirit and coffee uh you know it's probably about 20 to 1 we'll come back into the hall and actually it's a bit like an hour's lunch at work probably around 20 to 2 you know and actually if we try and creep it a bit more it's 10 to 2 we kind of make our way home so you're thinking well it's sunday afternoon it's an hour where we just fellowship and uh, have some food together. So that'll be happening today. Mark, can I encourage you to come up? I'm going to pray for you, and uh, the, uh, the floor is yours. Jesus. Hallelujah. Father, I just thank you for, for, for Mark. Thank you for all that you've put in his heart. Lord, I pray that as he ministers your word to us this morning, Lord, he would have freedom. He would, he would move wherever he feels your spirit is moving and guiding, Lord, and encourage him and bless him greatly. We pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Bless you. Good. Is this on? Yes. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name's Mark. This is Maddie. He has been said, it's a real joy to be with you this morning. Thanks so much to, to Ben and the guys here for inviting us, even on our wedding anniversary. But it's worth it for you lot. Well, that's what I told Maddie. Uh, <laughs> uh, 29 years. 
What do you think? That's not, yeah, that's not bad, is it? Yeah, well. <laughs> they got married younger back then. We got married, yeah. Child, child brides, all that sort of thing. So, um, uh, It's been great to get to know Ben through his studies at King's School of Theology, uh, which we run. It's been really fun uh, to have Ben part of that um, and also to get to know Ben and have friendship with him and all that sort of thing. But I don't know if you could put my PowerPoint up there. I feel like oh, he's working on it. He's working on it. Is it there? There we go. So what I want to talk about today is Church Around the Table. But before I do that, I wanted to just give you proof that Ben did turn up. So I don't know if this is working. Let's. There we go. There he is. There he is. So the, yeah, he was there. I was expecting shorts this morning because I think I've only ever seen him in shorts. To be honest, I almost wore shorts. I'm pleased that I just upgraded slightly because I thought that was the style. Uh, yeah, I found this other picture. Um, I don't know. And this is a caption competition type picture, isn't it? It's like, to be honest, I feel a bit sorry for this guy on the right. I think Ben's having a bit of a word, don't you? He's like, let me tell you a few things about theology, mate. And he's going, what? What? Was it me, mate? You know, what's going on? Uh, so I don't know if you, have you, has Ben ever looked at you like that? This is it. Yeah, yeah, is that right? This is this pastoral talent coming out. Like, okay, Ben, whatever. Don't mess. <laughs> so, no, it's been a real joy to have, uh, get to know Ben through, through King's School of Theology. Just to say, at King's School of Theology, we, uh, our kind of caption, if you like, is theology for everyone. Even Ben. <laughs> hey, if we can, no, no, I won't go there. If we can do Ben, we do anyone. No, it, uh, theology for everyone. And we really believe that theology is about equipping everyone for life and for ministry. So theology isn't just for those people who get to stand on stage and deliver stuff. Theology is about how we understand our place in the world, how we understand what God's up to in the world. And therefore, it's not just church leaders who need that, although they do, uh, but also builders and lawyers, and van drivers, and nurses, and youth workers, and even marketing consultants. You know, we've got a marketing consultant. She needs theology. We all need theology. We all need to think biblically about what God, who we are, who God is, and what God is up to in the world. So um, at KST, theology for everyone means for us that we make it as accessible as possible. So our models for learning are ways that you can study in the midst of life. And uh, we have the joy because of that to have a real diverse uh, student population in the sense of they're all over the country. In fact, they're all over the world now um, because we're delivering it online as well. But also there's young people and old people, uh, early 20s. My, the oldest graduate of KST was 83. Uh, and I, I could have showed you the video of, it, of his kind of end of course thing where he's just in tears going, saying, I'm just so in love with Jesus. Oh, it's beautiful. If, that, if theology doesn't leave you in tears going, I'm so in love with Jesus, then we're missing a bit of something, aren't we? So it's just a beautiful that, um, that when we dig into God, dig into his word, our love and knowledge of God goes deeper. Our ability to live for him in the world goes deeper. And that's what we're about at so if there's anything about that, which makes you think, oh, maybe maybe I could benefit from a bit of that, um, Ben's given me permission just to say, hey, have a chat. Have a chat. There's a, there's a leaflet out on the foyer. There's even a free pen and a free bookmark. Freebies this morning. I know. I know. I know. This is just the kind of people we are. Uh, so no, gra grab a leaflet. Maybe stick your name down on the list there and it, give me your email address and I'll give you a little bit more information. But um, if, if you'd like to dig deeper into God, deeper into his word, then why not think about joining us at KST. So there we go. You can also look at kingstheology.org. Um, it's gone. Um, <laughs> so there we are. So uh, yeah, that's KST. But this morning I don't want to talk to you just about KST. I could, because it's good. Uh, but today I want to talk to you about church around the table church around the table. And this, this emerged for us in our church. So we also, me and Maddie, also lead a church in Northampton. It's house church. We meet mainly in our lounge. And we uh, started to explore, probably about a year ago, what happened with Jesus and tables. Uh, because as we, maybe you feel like this a year, a year on, but as we came out of 
the pandemic and lockdowns and all that sort of thing, we just felt like we got out of something of the habit of getting around the table together. And so we decided to spend some time looking at what happened when Jesus got around the ta table with people. There's a guy called Tim Chester, and he says that in the book of Luke, Jesus is either going to a meal, at a meal, or coming from a meal. It sounds about right, doesn't it? <laughs> Jesus liked a meal uh, and <laughs> enjoyed fellowshipping with uh, people. And our question as we studied that, and we, what you're getting this morning in the next half an hour, um, maybe a bit shorter. I'm trying to say maybe a bit longer because I'm, no, no, it's fine. Uh, is a kind of summary of our three-month study through the, the Gospel of Luke looking at Jesus eating with people. Is that okay? And uh, so you'll get a bit of a potty. So if I speed up at points, and you'll, um, you just have to apologize. I apologize already, but it's that sense. What I, I want to give you a sense of what happens when Jesus encounters people around the table in order to inspire us and to make us realize what God might do in our lives. Because we all end up around a table, right? We all eat. Like I'm in the right place, aren't I? We are, okay. We all, I mean, yeah, you're about to have a picnic. So we, we all eat together. So what, what if... What we see in the Gospel of Luke is that these become holy moments. Moments of kingdom breaking in and transforming people's lives. Encounter moments with Jesus. And so we're going to look at these three different types of encounter. And I kind of libel, labeled them as three tables. And that's just a way to... Because as we looked at this, what we realized is, oh, Jesus around the table, that just seems... A, you know, lots of that's going on. And we just saw that there were broadly, there were three types, three types of encounter of Jesus around the table. And I've labeled them like this, close table, open table, and life table. So that's where we're going this morning, three table. And so we'll start on the first one, close table. And as we look at this, we are, thanks for doing that, but I just keep that clicking because I always forget to click it. So that, that's great. Uh, we're going to start at the end, the most famous meal that we see of uh, Jesus, and that is the Last Supper. And in the Gospel of Luke, we find that in Luke 22. We're going to look at Luke 22 briefly. So, sorry, I'm just not quite sure what's behind me sometimes. Is it up or not? No, I don't know. Anyway, so the, actually, the, so this Last Supper meal that Jesus has. We know that one, don't we? You know what I'm talking about, the Last Supper. Very famous. It's Jesus with his disciples, the Passover, just before he gets arrested uh, and killed and then rose again. So we know that story. And, and at this point in the Last Supper, Jesus actually institutes the meal that we all celebrate together, all Christians around the world, don't we? The Lord's Supper, uh, communion, breaking of bread, whatever we call it. So this moment of the Last Supper is, lies right at the heart of Christianity. Have you thought about that? That a meal lies right at the heart of Christianity. Very simple meal. That's the heart. I don't know, uh, as, as we stand here today, this is fairly typical of, you know, most churches these days, isn't it? And what do we find at the front of our meeting? A platform, a drum kit, obviously, needed. But broadly, a worship team, don't we? Or we might find in other churches, a pulpit. Actually, traditionally in the church, if we were going to go into an Anglican church down the road, we wouldn't see either of those things at the center. What would we see? Now, I'd love this picture if possible. We'd see a table. Here it comes, hopefully. There we go. Now, this is rather more grandiose than my living room. Uh, but isn't that interesting? In all the pompous, you know, the pomp what's not, it's not, I don't mean pompous. What do I mean? Pomp and ceremony. Thank you. That, scrub that from the tape. <laughs> don't, don't. Uh, <laughs> pomp and ceremony we find right at the heart of it we find a table isn't that interesting why now if you go into high anglican churches obviously that becomes an altar and i have a bit more of a problem with that but i actually don't have a problem in fact i am challenged by it that right at the heart at this front the core of these traditional church setting is a table not a worship team not a pulpit but a table because right at the heart of Christianity lies a simple meal. So we're probably more familiar with this next slide. 
Um, it's coming up. There we go. Maybe more fully this uh, painting, Da Vinci of the of the Last Supper. Um, so this idea is quite an interesting painting, actually. The more you look at it, because it's what we're going to discover as we look at this is that this isn't a rather pristine gathering like we might have seen in that previous picture with all the pomp and ceremony. Okay, all right. Uh, actually, there's a bit of dispute and there's a bit of disagreement at this particular table. This became, uh, came to be called in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul calls it the Lord's Supper. Whereas he reflects on this last supper, it became the Lord's Supper. Supper's a funny word, isn't it? Have you, I don't know if you've thought about this. And, uh, um, maybe if you're not English, you don't realize what a confusing word the word, maybe you've realized, actually, or maybe the confusing word the word supper is. Because I don't know if you've read you know, one of those kind of tabloid articles on things that determine which class you're in in English society. Often it, de it depends on how you use the word supper. Is that right? Like, I don't know, yeah? I mean, for me, I, see, for me, s supper means that sneaky little bit of toast you go just before you go to bed. Is that right? I, I've got a friend. He's probably just a little bit more uh, high class than, than me. Supper means the evening meal. So he says, come around for supper. And I'm thinking, mate, I better, come, I better eat before I come. And I go, oh, no. Like, because tea is the tea and cake that you have at 4 o'clock, apparently. Is that right? Yeah, and supper is the thing, the proper meal that you have later. It's so confusing. Like, the, the, these words, lunch, dinner, tea, supper, what is going on? I'm English, I haven't got a clue. Like, I, someone comes come around for tea, what am I going to get? I don't know, cucumber sandwiches? Or, you know, like a slap of meal, I, don't, I have no idea. So I find that, as a, you know, someone who reads the Bible, like all of us, I find this word supper really frustrating. The last supper. Right, are they eating toast or that bowl of cereal? That's the other thing, isn't it, just before you go to bed? A bit of bowl of cereal, that's your supper. Is that what they're doing? No, this is a feast. This is a Passover feast. And when Paul in 1 Corinthians 11 said, talks about the Lord's, so this is the last supper, talks about the Lord's supper, he's not talking about tea and toast. He's talking about a feast. That's what he's talking about, the word supper. And the word in Greek is depnon. It just means dinner. Yeah, it doesn't help, does it? Because we all have different definitions of dinner. It means, a f okay, let's use a different word. It means that word feast. The Lord's feast. This is the last feast. Does that give you a bit slightly different conception in your mind? The last feast. Because this is the nature of uh, the meal that Jesus is had. And so let me just read a few verses here from Luke 22. I could keep going, talking about supper because I get quite emotional about it. But, yeah. Yeah, someone's, people are going, yeah, just move on now. You've made your point. Yeah, fine. So I'm going to read this bit of the last feast. You with me? Okay, good. Uh, 22, 14. Here it comes. Uh, once I found it. There we go. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. Pause. Reclined. That gives us a clue that this is a feast. Uh, so they didn't come sit on their chairs reclined, that's how you did that when you had these kind of big feasts in that day and age. You reclined, which meant you, I'm not going to model it. I don't think I'd get up again. You know, legs out to one side, leaning back, probably leaning on the guy, on the guy or gal who's, who's next to you. They reclined at the table. Where was I? Can't do that with every verse, can I? And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this, divide it among you, for I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. But the hand of him who's going to betray me is with mine on the table. The Son of Man will go as it has been decreed, but woe to that man who betrays him. Then they began to question among themselves which of them might, it might be who would do this. Then a dispute aro arose also among them as to which of them was the greatest. 
I'm not going to go into that. I'm just going to note that point and skip on to verse um, 31. But isn't that interesting, by the way? <laughs> right at the heart of this last feast, you're still with me, aren't you? That supper feast word. Last feast, we find, what do we find? Disputes, arguments. I don't know how you imagine that. The Last Supper. I'm going to go back there. The Last Supper. What's it like? Oh, this, this wonderful, serene moment, holy moment of Jesus sharing blood, you know, a cup of wine and the bread. Wonderful moment. I was quite shocked when I read that, when we read it as a church community together. To go, they, they were arguing. I mean, it's a good job our churches aren't like that, are they? In the midst of that, there was arguing. In the midst of that, there was betrayal. Someone was about to betray Jesus. And in fact, if I just read 31 as well, Jesus says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that you may, your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. But, but Simon replied, Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus answered, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you'll deny me three times that you know me. I'm just... I'm going to stop there. I see, I read that story and, it, and I realize that it's a clash with my thinking about what this Last Supper is all is like. Do you, do you, are you, you with me? Did you imagine that quite precisely? We've got in the midst of this Last Supper, this great holy moment where Jesus longs, he says, I long to eat this food with you. I want this meal with you. What's this meal like? They're arguing. There's betrayal. If we read a bit further, we'll see there's misunderstanding and Jesus gets a bit fed up with them. Isn't this interesting that right in the midst of this meal, Jesus is there. Right in the midst of, and there is conflict as well in the midst of it. But Jesus clearly is the host of this meal. So the nature of this close table that I'm talking about is that Jesus is the host and we are the guests. The thing is, when you're a host of a meal, you get to determine what happens about how that meal proceeds, how it happens. I was um, in Nepal just, uh, just before COVID hit, so 2019, and we were visiting a lovely Nepali family in Kathmandu. And they didn't speak any English, but they were desperate to host us and, and uh, give us food. So we went around for a meal. It was, um, as you will discover, one of the most traumatic meals I've had. And the reason was because of the clash of cultures. So I went into the meal, and they served me. They, they carried, carried serving round. So what I thought they said was bitten rice. I realized it was the accent. It's beaten rice. And it's rice that's like a, a crisp, if you like. Um, so we served beaten rice, really lovely. Um, lots of curry dishes, chutney dishes, veg dishes, all these things. And it was, we served it on the plate. And I started to eat it, and I did the English thing which is that I cleared my plate fully, almost licked it clean. At which point, they came, and with another round of beaten rice and curry and all these things, and I'm going, okay. So I did reduce the amount I took the second time round. You know, I just thought, okay, I, I know I just need to, to take a little bit less, okay. Now, at the same time I'm doing this, there's a, there's a young Nepali girl there, she was late teens, and they served her this beaten rice, and she said, can I have another plate, please? And I thought, oh, that's bold. You know, she wants to eat a bit more. No, that wasn't what she was doing. She got another plate, and she started taking food off her plate, putting it onto this other side plate they'd been given, and she pushed it away. <laughs> Basically saying, I'm not eating that. You know, like I'm dumb. I don't need to. And I'm going, how rude. I can't believe she would do that. Goodness. So they came around, they, they ate, ate more, and gradually... Basically, what I discovered is every time I cleared the plate, they'd come around with, with more food. And being English, I, just, you know, I thought that if they offered me food, I needed to take some. What I didn't quite realize is that, that meant that, I, you know, that they, as a good host, were providing me more and more food as I went. And I was eating more and more food um, to the point where my, my, you know, my full nature, my rounded stomach, you know, gave way to my politeness or overtook my politeness. And I'm going, no, no seriously, I can't eat another thing. Um, so yeah, uh, th this was a clash of hosting cultures, right? Uh, so I went out, and this, um, we, we left that. I rolled my way out of the apartment, um, went out and go, goodness, and this, this, this is where it really got really bad, because this Nepali girl who was with us, she said to us, um, Mark, she said, don't drink any water. I'm like, what, what do you mean, don't drink any water? Like, water's exactly what I need right now. She said, no, B 
beaten rice swells in your stomach. This is going to be something out of a horror movie or something. I'm just about to burst like at this. I drink water. I didn't drink any water. No, I'm not touching any liquids forever. <laughs> this is what happens. So all that to say is that when you host a meal, you get to determine how that meal takes place, right? And what happened there is I thought it knew how it worked, and actually they were hosting, and so they determined how that meal took place. In this meal, at the Last Supper, Jesus is the host. And he gets to determine how this meal takes place, right? So we end up in 1 Corinthians 11, where Paul is reflecting back on the Last Supper, and he calls it the Lord's Supper. Again, it's the Lord's Feast. Goodness, we re- misread that chapter. I haven't got time to do that today, but it's the Lord's Feast. And the big problem at this feast in 1 Corinthians 11 is that the rich people are eating lots of food, like me at the Nepali people's house, fancy food, which is also true, to be honest, it was delicious food. And the poor people, the poorer people, probably the slaves who had to work longer in the fields, they come, they arrive, and they eat the scraps. Jesus' response to this is that this, he says, this isn't, it's not the Lord's Supper you eat. It's not the Lord's Supper you eat. That first term, the Lord's Supper, is used in the negative. And he looks at a church who are gathering to eat, and he's saying, I don't know what you're doing because it's got nothing to do with Jesus. It's got nothing to do with Jesus. This is not the Lord's Supper because if it was the Lord's Supper, there would everyone be treated equally. Everyone would be treated eating the same food. If you want to show off your richness, go and do that at home because in this house, it's the Lord's house. It's his place. And in this place, everyone gets treated the same. Everyone eats the same. Isn't that crazy? I find that quite challenging, that in the very simple act of eating, actually, Paul goes further. He says, your meetings, get this, I hope that he never says that about our church or your church. Your meetings do more harm than good. Like, it would be better if you didn't bother. Why? Because one person is being treated one way, and another person is treated another at this close table, at this moment, at this, these feasts that Jesus gathered where he is the host and we are the guests. Jesus says, I'm the host, and this is how it works with me. <laughs> this is how it works, is that everyone gets treated equally and fairly. But even more than that, in the midst of this feast, as we've indicated, there is argument. There is dispute friend of mine, we were discussing this in church, a friend of mine said, I think I'd be quite comfortable at the Last Supper. <laughs> and I said, what do, you, what do you mean? He said, well, I think I'd probably be one of those arguing, one of those misunderstanding, and probably one of those, you know, possibly betraying. Like, I'm quite comfortable there. Why? Because I'm not perfect. <laughs> because I'm not coming to this as some kind of perfect guy, you know, thinking that I might ruin this rather pristine environment of the Last Supper. I'm not the one like, I'm just the same as everyone else. I'm going to feel, if, if there's that going on, I feel quite comfortable. And Jesus says, yeah, you're right, because I long to have this meal with you. This close supper is where Jesus is the host, and this is the point. Everyone is invited. Everyone is invited. There's a quote there. I don't know if you can just put it up for me from Miroslav Volf. Oh, yeah, no, I'll come back there. There we go. Church is not the club of the perfect, but the gathering in the spirit of people who understand and need their need of God and call out to Jesus. This is the basis and the foundation of the Lord's Supper, of the Lord's Feast, is that fundamentally church invites all comers. I don't know, if it, maybe today, I don't know how you feel. I don't know if you feel here, you're invading in some way. Like, do I feel comfortable here? I just want you to know that Jesus wants you here. This is the close table. This is this strong invitation, and Jesus wants you here. And whatever people's social status, however they use the word supper, <laughs> whatever their financial means, whatever their apparent spiritual state, whatever their gifting, whatever their role in church, None of those things matter. Jesus says, I want you here. I want you here. This is the close table. 
So at this close table, Jesus is the host, we are the guests. You'll be pleased to know the other two aren't going to take that long, so I've set it up perfectly to nail these. So in the midst of this table of where there's argument, betrayal, and misunderstanding, Jesus says this. Jesus says, this is my body, broken for you. What's he saying in that moment? That in the midst of this broken community, Jesus is saying, I'm taking all of that brokenness on myself. And healing is found as we, as he breaks himself and allows us to receive that healing, that moment. This is close table. This is the invitation of Jesus to each one of us to eat with him and to find a place of healing and wholeness as we come to him just as we are in our mess. So if we move then on to open table, we're going to move scenes. So there we were at the Last Supper or the Last Feast. We're zooming now backwards to the feeding of the 5,000. And we know this story, don't we, that they're out in the wilderness. There's no food around, no shops, no fast food places. It's just Jesus, his disciples, and 5,000 people sitting around. And the disciples are beginning to panic because they know that these people are going to need food. And they go to Jesus. Jesus right? You need to stop preaching. It's time to stop. Send them away. It's not going to work anymore. And Jesus says those, what I think are fateful words, like scary words. Do you know them? He says this. He says, you give them something to eat. And they're going, are you having a laugh? What are you talking about? And in that moment, what is happening is Jesus is is inviting the disciples, not now to be guests at his table, but they're inviting him to be co-hosts with him at the table. Jesus is saying, join me. So Jesus is creating this wonderful hosting environment where everyone is embraced. And now he's saying to the disciples, I want you to join me. I want you to be part of this exciting adventure of hosting people and, and receiving people in the way that I received others. What have you got, Jesus says. Well, disciples have only got one thing to offer. That's five loaves and two fish. Not enough <laughs> to feed what's going on. Sometimes, you know, Jesus, Jesus questions to us, don't reveal what we've got, <laughs> but they reveal what we haven't got. And in those moments, that question of, what have you got? And they go, well, this is all we've got. Jesus is saying, that's enough. And if we're willing to take the little that we've got and put them in the hands of Jesus, what happens again? This Jesus breaks the bread and hands it back to them. And says, now go and share it. And I'm calling this the open table, where we're invited to co-host with Jesus. And Jesus takes the little that we've got, puts it in his hands. He breaks it. He gives it back to us and says, go and share it. I don't know what you, how you imagine that feeding the 5,000 event happening, but I wonder where, have you ever asked this question? Where does the multiplication happen? Doesn't it? Like, it's not like, poof, oh, now I've got a basketball of, thousands of loaves, now it's going to work. No, the disciples are heading out into those groups of 50 with just like half a loaf, going, I don't know how it worked. Have you thought about this? Like, the first one, I think they gave them just a little bit. Here you go. Yeah, sorry, mate, it's got to to go around everyone. And somehow, in that moment of sharing, it going, see, the multiplication, in my view, happened in their own hands as though they were willing to take what they've got and join with Jesus in sharing for others. See, this was Jesus' miracle, wasn't it? But Jesus is saying, hey, guys, I want you in the game. I want, this is going to be fun. It's going to be scary. It's going to be fun. As we take the little bit we've got and keep sharing it, Jesus invites us not only to be guests at his table, lost in wonder, love, of change, long, love, and, love, wonder, love and praise, and arguing and betrayal as well, as guests, not just that, but Jesus goes, I want you now to become, to join me with me in hosting. Where are those moments? See, this hosting for us, I think, doesn't happen here. It doesn't happen here. I mean, maybe it does your community lunch. That's kind of an open table in kind of the way I'm using it here, maybe, where you get, you go, yeah, we're going to serve the people. We're going to express the love and the wonder and acceptance and grace of Jesus as we uh, work with people. Do you know what? More often than not, it's going to be with you, probably in your own home. 
That's where the open table happens. That's where we become hosts. We, begin, we get to set the atmosphere and set the context, just like Jesus was this host who set this new atmosphere of the way that this feast is running, and he's going, you get to do that with me. You get to do that with me. I, I remember this one particular lady called uh, Shan. She uh, was 19, grew up in care, and uh, she, yeah, she was in a lesbian relationship with a daughter of someone in our church, and we had her around the table, and we did what we always did at the, at the time. Kids were a little bit younger, and we held hands around the table as we said grace together before we eat, and she was beaming. She just said, oh, this is so amazing. I could be part of this. I think she thought she was in some kind of Fast and Furious movie. For the, you know, maybe you haven't seen that. But the uh, Fast and Furious movies, they always end with this kind of moment where they're all reaching around a table, family thing. But she was like, and she was, but we get to accept this. It, we, what were we doing there? We're expressing the welcome of Jesus. And she loved it. She loved this idea that she could be included. And we loved to welcome her. I don't know if you've ever noticed, you know, we know this call of the disciples. Jesus goes up to Peter the fisherman, and uh, he's, he's working on his nets, and Jesus says to him, come and follow me. And what does he say? He, say, he drops everything, is that what he says? Drops everything and follow me. And we go, wow, I wonder what they went next. They went off. They went off around the countryside. They went off to the lake. They went off to Jerusalem. That verse is in Mark 1.13. Do you know where they end up in Mark 1.29? Just 16 verses later, back at Peter's house. Actually, if you remember the story, Peter's mother-in-law is ill in bed. Jesus comes. He heals the mother-in-law. Then the weirdest verse in the Bible, she gets up and she waits on them. Like, as a media, it's like, you could read that funny, couldn't you? Jesus going a bit hungry. There's no one here to make any food. No, that's clearly not what happened. But... She, she's healed, she creates food. By the end of that little passage, we find that the whole of the town is gathering at Peter's door, wanting something of Jesus for what he can do with them. I'm really sorry, guys, but following Jesus doesn't just take you to the ends of the earth. <laughs> following Jesus takes you home. And when Jesus takes you home, he brings his friends. <laughs> That's how it works. Jesus changes all of our life, including our home. How does Jesus want us to express open table through our homes? Because that's where Jesus is. But there are other things as well that we can get involved with, our little bit in the hands of Jesus. Uh, there's a friend of mine who rung a community choir. It's a brilliant open table in that sense, of that ability to set the tone. And in that choir, they uh, help people gain confidence, place of acceptance. In fact, recently they're on stage, it is in Derby, and they're on stage doing a performance in their kind of park festival, that sort of thing. Brilliant, taking people with low confidence, treating them like Jesus would treat them, seeing transformation. Brilliant. For me, that's something of this open table opportunity. Maddie runs a housing project in Northampton. How do we create homes for people who don't have them? These are ways of expressing the welcome and love of Jesus to others, where Jesus invites us not only to be the guest, but to be the host. Are you with me? Close table, open table. This is going to be very quick. <laughs> so it's fine. It's going to get, it, it, all the ground is laid. The last one is this one, and I can only call it, and I, can, I wonder if I can have the image up, life table. And this is the surprising thing, that as we read through the book of Luke, and we saw where these encounters happen with Jesus and people, it did happen with Jesus where he was hosting these disciples. It did happen where Jesus invited his disciples to host with him, but most of the time, most of the time it happened when Jesus was the guest. Zacchaeus, we know that story, don't we? Jesus says, Zacchaeus, hi, I'm coming home, with, I'm going to your house today. What? My house? And as he went, as Jesus entered that house, not as the host, but as the guest, he brought in a transformational encounter with the kingdom that changed Zacchaeus' life. I've got obviously no time to read any of that, and I wasn't planning to anyway, but Jesus does not only invite us as guests to his table, he doesn't only invite us as co hosts to share with him all that he offers to people, but as we are guests, we get to be kingdom bringers wherever we find ourselves. 
So I asked our community, you're with me, aren't you? I don't need to go into detail here. I asked our community, our church community, I said, where in your life, not here now, not even at picnic, not even after this, not even that, where in your life is your table? Where's your life table? Where do you think of, when I say you've got a table in your life, where is it? And uh, can I have that up? The first one, my friend of mine who's a lawyer, he uses the word supper in the proper way. Uh, yeah. You get the idea. But he said, he said, hey, you talk about the idea of life table. Where's my table that I am at in my life? It's probably more glamorous than his. He said, it's the boardroom table. I'm a director in a law, I'm partner in a law firm. It's the, it's the boardroom table. And I go, well, Ed, what, how are you bringing the, Jesus into that place? How are you bringing the kingdom into that place then? That's the table God's called you to as a guest, not as the host. How do you bring the kingdom into that place? He's going, yeah, good point. The next guy, my friend Charlie, if I have the next one, he says, well, funny enough, this week I went for a beer after work with one of my mates. Uh, and at my table, that comes to mind when you talk about life table, is in the pub. I use a cafe, but you know what I mean. It's in a pub, and that's the table. And he said, funny enough, this week, as we chatted over a pint, we had a brilliant conversation about faith and what I'm up to and how and Jesus. Maybe that's my life table. Maybe that's the place where I'm bringing the kingdom and the l- love of Jesus into that space. And then the last one I'll mention, if I could, is a lovely Nepali lady called Prashna. And she said, she's a care worker. <laughs> she said, <laughs> she said um, this is my life table. When I get to feed people in their beds <laughs> as a care worker. She's funny, yeah, Prashna, she's probably, I don't know, but she's very short, but she's a lovely, just a vibrant personality. And she said, in this cheeky sort of way, she says, Sometimes I pray for them. <laughs> she says, but I'm doing uh, out loud, she means, because she says, as I'm feeding them, I'm praying for them. She said, actually, the truth is, she said, in Nepal, when I lived in Nepal, it was quite a Christ- it was a big church, and I was caught up with church life. She said, since I've come to the UK and I've taken this job, I've realized that I'm a missionary. I've realized I'm a missionary. And this is my place of mission. As I help these old people to eat their food. I talk to them. I love them. She says, not everyone does that. I pray for them. I feed them. And that was the thing. Sometimes I pray for them out loud. (laughs) I'm bringing Jesus to that place. I said, Prussian is the most wonderful thing I've ever heard. (laughs) In terms of someone who understands the call of Jesus to be a transforming presence wherever they go because they've realized that as the guest, their kingdom bringers into all sorts of spaces of life. So my question to you guys, (laughs) when I talk about life table, when I say where are those moments where you're not the host, you don't get to dictate, you know, what's on the table and all that sort of thing, but you do get to be the guest. And even in those moments, you know, in Luke 10, Jesus sends out uh, the 72 and he says, go into a town, don't go with anything. Go with nothing. Don't even go with food. Don't go with money. Go with nothing and head into a town and go, so you just like meet people. And the first person that invites you into their house as the guest, go with them and say, peace to this house. And he says, in that moment, the kingdom of God has arrived for them. So I don't, I don't know what your life tables are. I don't know where those moments are. I don't know the moments that you get invited into spaces and maybe you feel powerless. Maybe you feel like you're not making a difference. But I want you to know today that you carry the Spirit of God into that place. You are commissioned by Jesus to live out this life table and to bring the presence and kingdom of God into every space. And that expectation of the kingdom coming, even as the simple as that, how simple are those words? Peace to this house. Peace to this pub table. Peace to this boardroom table. Peace to this individual that I can serve. Peace to this place. In that moment, the kingdom of God is breaking out through you. Amen.
Can I bless you and pray for you before we finish? We've got time for that. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Just thank you for this wonderful church today, God. Thank you that we are so invited, God, to your table. Jesus, your feast, we're so invited. Whatever we feel like today, whatever class, whatever social means, whatever spiritual state, whether we feel like we're in a mess, whether we feel like we've had too many arguments, God, I thank you today. Jesus, you invite us to your table and we receive your invitation. Thank you that you want us with you. And we're grateful for that. Thank you too, Lord, for your invitation, not only to be guests at your table, to be co-hosts with you, where we can set wonderful, welcoming atmospheres for people around us, where we get to set that tone to be wonderful hosts, just like you, Jesus, and to host something like the Lord's Supper, (laughs) the Lord's Feast, because it's your way, Jesus. Thank you for those times we get to do that. Would you allow us to do that? Where you come, maybe you want to transform our homes, Lord, into greater places of welcome. Lord, challenge us with that. Thank you, Lord, you don't want us to be perfect, but you do want us to put our little and put them in your hands. And as you break it and as we give it, you're going to do more than we could ask or imagine. Thank you, Lord. And I thank you, Lord, finally, for the wonderful places that we find ourselves, the cafes, the workplaces, the homes that we find ourselves in, the tables, as it were, that we're part of. I thank you, Lord, that you, by your Spirit, have made us kingdom bringers into those spaces. Give us faith, Lord, to believe that even because we're there, you're there. Because, we want, because we're looking to you, Lord, that you're able to do amazing stuff in the people that we meet and the people that we know. I pray, Lord, even this week, as would you bring, even today, right now, Lord, would you give to mind the, what that table is for each of us? Would you just give us a thought, Lord, where that table is for each of us today? And as we find ourselves around that table this week, Lord, may we be conscious of you, conscious of your kingdom, conscious of what you might want to do in that space as we bring peace to that place and declare peace over that place. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Let's give him a round of applause. Bless you. That was so good. Oh, that was so good. Mark, will you come back? Would you come back as well? Yeah. If you see the arc of what God has been doing in the church these last few months around the place of mission and the place of reaching out. I'm not going to tell you, I want you to reflect on that. And Mark didn't know, but he's brought a close to the series we've been going through, Compelled. For Christ's love compels us to speak of him. Do you know, in 2019, when this church was seeking after God, November, right before, some months before the pandemic hit, as if God didn't know, God gave us a couple of words. First was, I see a table. In fact, it was a round table where the church and the unchurch are sitting down together enjoying the goodness of God. And so as Mark, a couple of months ago, was sharing these in the tables, I felt the Holy Spirit stir me. So, oh my goodness, you've got to come and share that. Wasn't that awesome? And at each one, there's a place. There's a place. Even the closed table, there's a place for those that don't know him to come in. Every single one. Closed, open, life. Life. What else did God say in 2019? I'm reducing the gap between the secular and the spiritual. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about that. There's no no man's land where we come from our nice close table into an open space and we ask you to come in, yeah, and then we go back again. Mark's told us about that. So I want you to go away and I want you to reflect over these last few months about what God is asking us to do as a church. And it starts out there. It's easy for us to put stuff on here where we can host a table, and we do. But the real, the real growth comes is when you take your open, closed life table, wherever it looks, out there. Out there. And I want to challenge you and encourage you and watch God move. Amen? Amen. Amen. I didn't mean to bring a PS, but I was just so encouraged. Thank you, Mark, for what you brought this morning. Hallelujah. God, you're so good. We love you. 
We adore you, Lord. Continue to sharpen us, to challenge us, to stretch us around our different tables. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, church. We're going to break for tea and coffee. If you've got children to collect, please do collect them straight away. We've got so much coffee and tea. It'll still be here after you've got them. Come have a chat to Mark. Please do. Yeah. Come and think about King's School of Theology. It really, really was a great time that I spent there as well. And we'll be back in the room at about 20 to 1 for those who are stopping for picnic. Bless you, church. We'll see you soon. Thank you.